In this lecture, we're going to look at the heart. Now the heart's located in an area of the chest called the mediastinum. Here's the mediastinum. There's quite a bit going on in the mediastinum. Um, you're going to find major blood vessels, such as the aorta, the vena cava, um, the esophagus. You're going to find some bronchial tubes, depending on where you slice in the mediastinum. So there is a lot going in on, I should say, in a very small space. And again, here's another picture, an anterior view. And um, the heart is um, about the size of your fist. So if you made a fist to put it up by your chest, that's about the size of the heart. Now, when we look at some of these anatomy models, they seem kind of large. Um, you get a little more perspective if you're looking at like one of the anatomy torsos. Um, but uh, the heart is not that large, but it does a lot of work. Now, the heart's enclosed with a, a serous membrane called the pericardium. Remember, serous membranes are usually uh, double layered. And um, it would be like if you took a balloon and say you put your fist down into the balloon and it kind of, the balloon wrapped around your, your fist. Okay, that, that would be like a serous membrane. Okay, and, and we see it here in this picture here where we're taking a heart, pushing it down into what looks like a balloon. <clears throat> Excuse me. And um, you're going to get this double layered membrane. Now remember, an organ is a viscera. So the part of the membrane that touches the organ, in this case the heart, is going to be the visceral layer of the serous pericardium. The part that's out on the perimeter is the parietal layer of the serous pericardium. So again, think of perimeter for parietal. And remember, an organ is a viscera, so this is the visceral layer. And then there's a pericardial cavity. Now this picture is showing it very large. In reality, um, there's almost no space in there. Okay, there's going to be some pericardial fluid in there, just enough to relieve the friction. And that's the function of a, a serous membrane, basically, is to prevent friction. So instead of the heart, uh, while it's beating, rubbing up against the tissues in the chest, it's surrounded by this slippery membrane, and that's going to reduce the friction. Okay. Now, the reason we're talking about a serous pericardium is because we also have another part of pericardium, and that's going to be the fibrous pericardium. <clears throat> so altogether, the pericardium consists of an outer fibrous pericardium and an inner serous pericardium. And the serous pericardium has two layers, as we mentioned, the visceral up against the heart and the parietal, which is off on the perimeter and like I said before, the visceral and parietal layers are separated by serous fluid, pericardial fluid. And, um, and that fills that fluid-filled space. And again, it's not as large as they show it there. Unless you get some bleeding into the pericardial cavity, or if you get an infection or inflammation, it can put excess fluid into that pericardial cavity. And then we have a problem. Um, as fluid begins to build up in that cavity, <clears throat> it can start to compress the heart, and we call that a pericardial tamponade. And if a patient has a pericardial tamponade, they have to very carefully insert a needle into that pericardium and suck that fluid out, because as the fluid builds up, it's like squeezing on the heart and it's not allowing the heart to pump blood efficiently. Now there's three layers to the heart wall itself. We have the epicardium 
And epi means outside. Remember like your epidermis is above your dermis. It's on the out outermost layer. So this is the layer that's above the heart. Now, just to confuse you, the epicardium is the visceral layer of the serous pericardium. You can see it down here. So the visceral layer of the serous pericardium is the epicardium. Okay, so don't blame me. I didn't make that up. Um, but they are the same thing. Now the part that, that's doing all the work is the myocardium. Remember, myo means muscle. So that's the muscular layer of the heart. So that's where the contraction is taking place. And then on the inside, we're going to have the endocardium. Endo means inside. And the endocardium is very smooth, shiny, and slippery. Um, because what does blood like to do if it just sits? Well, blood clots, right? And um, that's not a good thing when you have all these little nooks and crannies uh, in the heart. Um, blood can get caught up in there, cause a clot, and then sent off to the, the body. So um, the inside of the heart, the endocardium, also the inside of the blood vessels, the endothelium, is going to be very smooth and shiny. Think of like a, a new nonstick pan. So if you do any cooking, you know, um, you've got this new nonstick pan, you know, you can put things in it, nothing sticks, right? What can happen over time though, think about the pan. What happens if somebody uses like a metal spatula and tongs and you get little scratches or they stack the pans up and you're like, uh, hey, don't go stacking the pans up. And then and then she's like, well, then you wash your own pans. And I'm like, fine, I will. And, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, TMI. Um, <clears throat> true story, though. But uh, over time in our blood vessels and our heart, we can get some oxidative damage, free radical damage. Um, things like that can start to cause little scuffs and uh, I wouldn't say tears, but but some some damage, some roughening of that smooth layer. And if you get a roughened area on that smooth layer, then blood can stick to it and a clot can build. Okay, but normally this acts to prevent clots. And while we're here, let's let's talk about the pericardium one more time, um, because we have the epicardium, which we know is the the visceral layer of the serous pericardium. Then we have our pericardial cavity, and then we have our fibrous pericardium on the outside here. Okay. And Think about this. If you've ever done any hiking or anything like that, one of the problems you can get um, with your uh, foot rubbing around inside the shoe, uh, you could develop blisters. <clears throat> I used to do a lot of backpacking and everything. And one thing I learned was um, you would take like a thin silk or polypropylene sock and you'd put that on your foot. Well, that would be like the um, visceral layer. Then you take your hiking sock and then you'd put that on over. And that would be like the parietal layer. Now when you walk, the two socks uh, slide back and forth. Uh, just like in the heart, the serous pericardium, uh, or I'm sorry, the uh, visceral serous pericardium and the parietal serous pericardium rub on each other. Okay, now you're ready to take your walk? Oh, nope, you need some shoes, right? So uh, you need your walking shoes or your hiking boots, and that's going to give your foot some support. Well, think about the uh, fibrous pericardium that way. It's not going to have much stretch or give. It's going to help support the heart. Think of the heart as kind of like a water balloon uh, because the heart is hollow. Blood is filling up in there. And if you held on to a, a water balloon at the top, you know it'll sag down. Well the that um, fibrous pericardium helps to keep it from sa over sagging and over stretching out okay so that's one way it helps to protect the heart now the chambers of the heart the chambers of the heart include two upper atria and two lower ventricles and so 
we'd have an atria here, an atria over here, ventricle here, ventricle here. And from the back, we can see the right atrium and the left atrium, and then the right ventricle and left ventricle. Remember when we're looking uh, from the front, it's going to be opposite. So this is the right atrium, this is the left atrium, right ventricle, left ventricle. Here we're looking from behind, and so it's going to be your right and left. Right atrium, left atrium, left ventricle, right ventricle. Yep. Also, let's take a look at some of the um, structures, um, the surface structures. Um, and we'll start here. What goes into the right atrium? We have the superior and inferior vena cava. And uh, the superior vena cava is going to re receive blood uh, from the head and upper body, and it's going to drain into these, which are called the brachiocephalic veins. Okay, so you have a, a right and a left brachiocephalic vein. Blood flows in here. This is coming from the rest of the body, uh, the blood, and it's going to also drain into the right atrium. Um, from there, it goes into the right ventricle. When the right ventricle contracts, it'll pump blood up here into the pulmonary trunk. And you see this little ligament here. This is called the ligamentum arteriosum. When we talk about fetal heart anatomy later on, we'll talk about how this originally in a fetus was a tube. It was a connection. So that some of the blood that's supposed to go to the lungs would just bypass that because as a fetus you don't need your lungs, right? Um, and that blood then goes straight into the aorta and out to the body. Okay, here's a confusing uh, part of the heart. Normally if you see these blue blood vessels, you're going to think what? Arteries or veins? You're probably going to think veins, right? And you'd be correct on anywhere else in the body if you saw a picture or drawing or diagram of the rest of the body and if some vessels were painted red um, then they were probably arteries if they're colored blue then uh, they were probably veins the heart's different here's what I want you to remember that arteries go away from the heart veins go toward the heart this is something that messed me up even in grad school because I would see these blue blood vessels, you know, and I would think that on the heart that they were going to be veins. And, of course, I got it wrong. Um, or I would look at, you know, what the book was labeled and I thought the book was wrong. No, it was me that was wrong. I never had a professor in all the anatomy classes I have taken in undergrad, grad, high school, etc., no one ever said that arteries go away from the heart, veins go toward the heart. Once I understood that, didn't have a problem. Okay, so the blood, like I said, is pumping out of the right ventricle here into the pulmonary trunk. And is this an artery or a vein? Oh, it's going away from the heart, so it must be an artery. This is the left pulmonary artery. Over here is the right pulmonary artery. So the blood goes to the lungs, picks up oxygen, comes back to the heart. Now, what vessels go toward the heart? Veins. So since the blood is going back toward the heart, here's your left pulmonary veins, and here's your right pulmonary veins. Even though they're red, the, this just means the blue here means it's unoxygenated blood, the red means it's oxygenated blood. We know this is going away from the heart, so it's an artery. This is going toward the heart, so it's a vein. Let's look at that from the other side. Again, here's the left pulmonary veins, right pulmonary veins. Okay, so don't forget that. While we're here, let's take a look at some of the other 
structures. Again, the superior vena cava, inferior vena cava, emptying into the right atrium. The right and left pulmonary veins emptying into the left atrium. Um, we have right here the ascending aorta. If we look at it from the front, here's the ascending aorta, then the aortic arch, ascending aorta, aortic arch. And then we have the descending aorta. Some books will call it the thoracic aorta. Okay. And then we have some blood vessels. And uh, jumping the gun a little bit, so this will uh, just help help to reinforce when we get to the coronary blood vessels. But we have a, a right coronary artery and a left coronary artery. The right coronary artery comes down. And then we're going to have some marginal branches. Okay, there's a couple of marginal branches. Again, the marginal branches um, go along the margin of the heart. The left coronary artery has a branch that uh, comes down in between the ventricles. So it's in the front of the heart. So we're going to call it the anterior interventricular artery. Forget about the sulcus. Sulcus is a depression or a groove, if you remember that from the skeletal system. What's more important, and I don't know why they don't have it labeled, because it is very important, is the anterior interventricular artery. Okay? Who cares about the sulcus? You know, if you go to your cardiologist, does he tell you, ah, I think you have a problem with your anterior interventricular sulcus? No, he's going to talk about the artery. And chances are he's probably not going to call it the anterior interventricular artery. That's a newer term. Usually, uh, clinically, um, this is referred to is the left anterior descending artery. We usually abbreviate it LAD. So if you work in a hospital and uh, you're looking at some cardiac patients, they might say they had a bypass you know, of the LAD. And this is what they're talking about. So again, anterior interventricular artery and the LAD or left anterior descending artery are the same thing. And then we have another branch that comes off and it's going to kind of uh, go around to the back of the heart and we call that the circumflex artery. Okay, if we look here, we can see the circumflex artery and here's the right coronary artery. And then this is going to be your um, posterior interventricular artery. Again, I'm kind of jumping the gun here, but uh, and we'll talk about these other vessels a little bit later. Now, the right atrium is going to receive blood from the superior and inferior vena cava and also the coronary sinus. I didn't mention the coronary sinus in the back. This is the coronary sinus. Let's not forget, wherever we see arteries, we're also going to have veins. Okay, and the arteries and veins don't go very far um, that actually feed the heart. All these other vessels go off to feed the rest of the body, uh, but the coronary arteries are the first branch off the aorta, and it feeds the heart. And then you'll have the veins right next to it. Now, all the veins are going to dump into the coronary sinus. And then the coronary sinus dumps into the right atrium. So you have three things, three vessels uh, that dump in to the right atrium. The superior and inferior vena cava and the coronary sinus. And this just shows a cadaver heart. But let me go back to this a moment. Um, we see, uh, again, the superior, inferior vena cava. Here they've opened up the right atrium. Here's the opening for the coronary sinus. Here's the openings, again, for the superior and inferior vena cava. Okay. And um, then we have a valve here. This first valve is going to be a tricuspid valve. A cusp is a flap. This one happens to have three flaps. 
So it's the tricuspid valve. And then we have these little strings coming off of the valve. Uh, you know, when they talk about tugging at your heart strings, well, here's the heart strings. These are called your chordae tendinae. Okay, chordae tendinae. Like here, my studi tendinae, these are your chordae tendinae. And they're going to attach then to these things called papillary muscles. Okay, so papillary muscles with a P. Here it is, papillary muscle. A papilla is a finger-like uh, structure. You can see how these are little finger-like structures. Think about these chordae tendinae kind of like on a, um, think of a parachute, for instance. You're holding on to the parachute. Your hands are going to be like the papillary muscles. If you want that, um, that um, parachute, and I, I'm thinking the old World War II style parachutes, not the new parasails they have now, but like those half round parachutes. If you pull down real hard on those, you're going to hold on to it and keep it from inverting. Okay, It would be like if you had an umbrella. And you know how if it gets too windy, the umbrella turns inside out? What if we tied strings to, you know, the, the little prongs on the uh, umbrella and brought it down to your hand? Now when the umbrella catches wind, it's not going to turn inside out. Well, that's the same thing that happens here. This keeps these chordae tendinae, keep the, um, the cusps of the um, valves here from turning inside out. We would call that a prolapse. Okay. And these little papillary muscles just pull down on the strings to keep those uh, cusps nice and tight. So again, we have a tricuspid valve here, three cusps. Over here, we have a bicuspid valve, uh, which is also called the mitre, uh, mitral valve. Sorry. Um, so bicuspid valve, the mitral valve. And again, it has chordae tendinae. These two valves... Again, I'm kind of jumping ahead a little bit, but these are going to be the, your AV valves or atrial ventricular valves. These valves are a little bit different. You have the pulmonary valve here and the aortic valve here. These are more like little cups, and when blood fills them up, it fills the little cups, and that's what closes up the valve and keeps the blood from back flowing. Okay? And again, we'll be reviewing these valves again. In between the two ventricles is the interventricular septum. Okay, there's also an interatrial septum as well. Um, but one thing, notice, look at this is the right ventricle. Look at the wall of the right ventricle. Look at the wall of the left ventricle. See how the right ventricle is so much thinner than the left ventricle. Why is that? Any idea? Okay, time's up. So the right ventricle is only pumping blood to the lungs. The left ventricle is pumping blood to the rest of the body. Again, these are muscles. So this is going to be pumping against more resistance. And think about when you go to the gym, what do you do? Resistance training, right? You keep adding heavier weights and then the muscles hypertrophy or, or enlarge. Same thing here, it's pumping against more resistance, so this side is going to enlarge more than this side. And some problems if you have like what we call stenosis of the pulmonary valve, um, and if this starts pushing against resistance, guess what's going to happen? This is going to enlarge as well. Or if we have some respiratory problem that's interfering with the blood vessels in the respiratory uh, tract, these, this muscle here will also enlarge. So you get what was called right ventricular hypertrophy. Okay. Again, here's the cadaver hat, um, heart. And you can see the papillary muscles, the chordae tendinae. Okay. Oh, one thing I wanted to mention too, um, See all these little folds here in the, the, the meat of the heart? Oh, wait a second. Meat. What, what's meat in Spanish? Anybody know? Carne. Well, this 
it kind of looks like the trabecula. Remember in the bone, you have the trabecula? So we call this the trabecula carne. Okay, trabecula carne. Oh, here we go. And we'll probably see some better pictures of that later. And so just going back and recapping, because I kind of went off on talking about uh, all the different structures and such. Um, let's just go ahead and follow along the slides here. So again, starting over, uh, the right atrium receives blood from the superior and inferior vena cava and the coronary sinus. So superior, inferior vena cava, coronary sinus. The right ventricle receives blood from the right atrium and sends blood to the lungs. So here's the right atrium. It's going to go through the tricuspid valve into the right ventricle, sends it to the lungs through the pulmonary trunk, and then pulmonary arteries. The left atrium receives blood from the pulmonary veins and blood coming back. Forget that they're red. They're going toward the heart, so they're veins. And the left ventricle is going to receive blood from the left atrium, and it's going to send blood all over the body. And as I mentioned before, and you can see it in this cadaver heart, that the wall of the left ventricle is much thicker than that of the right ventricle. The fibrous skeleton, the fibrous skeleton of the heart forms the foundation for which the heart valves attach. It serves as a point of insertion for cardiac muscle bundles. It prevents overstretching of the heart valve, and it also acts as an electrical insulator. One thing that's I, I never really seen mentioned in too many uh, books, but the way the heart contracts, think about like a, a tube of toothpaste. If you wanted to squeeze out all the toothpaste um, as efficiently as possible out of a tube of toothpaste. Do you start like right in the middle and give it a squeeze and hope everything comes out? No, you'd start at the very bottom and push, you know, from the bottom up and that's going to squirt out more toothpaste. The heart actually starts to contract down at the point of the heart, the apex of the heart, and that contraction wave goes from the bottom up. So it's like squeezing the toothpaste, you know, from the bottom of the tube up to the to the top. Okay. And um, part of that has to do with the way this fiber skeleton is um, arranged. Okay, the valves of the heart open and close in response to pressure changes as the heart contracts and relaxes. The right and left atrioventricular valves prevent backflow from the ventricles into the atria. Those atrioventricular uh, valves, remember when I mentioned the tricuspid and bicuspid or mitral valve? That's the atrioventricular valves. Then the right and left semilunar valves, that's going to be your pulmonary and aortic valves, they prevent backflow from the arteries back into the ventricles. And again, showing you that you have the cusps. Now, these are going to be the AV valves. Um, you have the cusps. Um, when the heart's relaxed, these will open up. Blood will flow through. Um, and then uh, just before the, the, um, the, they close, the atria are going to give a little squeeze of extra blood, pushes the blood in. Then it goes to backflow, that closes up the, the valve. And then as the ventricle goes to contract, these chordae tendinae contract down to tighten these up and it keeps the, the cusp closed. So again, you have the cusps, you have the chordae tendinae, and you have the papillary muscles. And then your semilunar valves See how they look like little cups? You can see it really good here. They're, they're just little cups. So, can we call it a cusp? Um, 
And again, as blood goes to backflow, it fills up these, these little cups here, and that's what seals off the valve. Okay. And this just shows here that um, when the, um, the um, AV valves, uh, which is your, your tricuspid valve and your bicuspid valve, um, they open up, heart, or, uh, blood goes down into the um, ventricles of the heart, okay? And then when the ventricles go to, to contract, the um, AV valves close up and seal it off. And then your semilunars, your aortic and your pulmonary valve open. Okay? And they alternate that way. And it's, it's not like um, one opens at a time. Um, you have, again, your AV valves open. Blood fills the ventricles uh, from the atria. The ventricles contract. These slam shut. And these open up. When I talk about them slamming shut, you can hear that when you put a stethoscope on the chest. That lub-dub sound you hear, that's the valves opening and closing. Now when we talk about the circulatory system, there's actually two circuits or two circulations that we can talk about. We have the pulmonary circuit or pulmonary circulation. And the right heart, we can actually talk about the heart as if it's two hearts, okay? And we typically do that clinically. We'll talk about right heart and we'll talk about left heart because the right heart is going to send blood to the pulmonary circuit or pulmonary circulation. Whereas the left heart is going to send blood to the systemic circuit or systemic circulation, okay? And um, so let's see. So let's start here. We have the right atrium, which has uh, deoxygenated blood, um, is going to send blood through the tricuspid valve into the right ventricle. From there, when the right ventricle contracts, it goes through the pulmonary valve into the pulmonary trunk and the pulmonary arteries. Here it goes to the pulmonary uh, circulation gives up carbon dioxide, picks up oxygen, and now it's on its way back to the heart uh, through the pulmonary veins, uh, which carries oxygenated blood. Uh, that blood then goes into the left atrium, so now we're in the left heart, uh, through the bicuspid or mitral valve into the left ventricle. And then um, when the left ventricle contracts, it goes through the aortic valve and then into the aorta and the systemic circulation. Okay. Now from there, it's going to go down to, we have arteries to arterioles to capillaries. Here it's going to give up oxygen to the tissues, pick up carbon dioxide from the tissues. And then on its way back uh, to the heart, um, it's going to put that blood into the inferior vena cava, if it's the lower part of the body, the superior vena cava, if it's the head and upper uh, part of the body, or the coronary sinus, if it was just blood going to the heart. And we start all over again. Okay, coronary circulation. Blood flows through coronary arteries and delivers oxygenated blood and nutrients to the myocardium. And the branches arise from the, um, they arise from the ascending aorta. And the coronary veins remove carbon dioxide and waste from the myocardium, and the branches converge and empty that blood into the coronary sinus. And we can see here, um, uh, let's see, this is this is the aorta, okay, and you can see the right coronary artery coming off. Now, over here's the left coronary artery. It's going to go back behind this pulmonary trunk and then attach to the, the um, aorta. Okay, so the heart is the one that's doing all the work. So guess who wants first dibs on the blood, right? That fresh oxygenated blood. It's going to be the heart muscle. 
So that is going to be the first branches, the right coronary artery and then the left coronary artery. So again, here are the branches. We'll start with the left coronary artery coming off the ascending aorta. If it continues down, we have the anterior interventricular branch. Okay. And again, we can call that the LAD, the left anterior descending. And then we have a circumflex branch that goes around to the back of the heart. On the other side, we have the right coronary artery that comes down. We can have marginal branches that go along this, the edge of the heart. And that right coronary artery goes around to the back of the heart. Sometimes they connect, sometimes they don't. Sometimes the anterior interventricular artery will connect up with the posterior interventricular artery. Now in this particular um, picture, it's showing the posterior interventricular branch coming off of the right coronary artery. Other books you might look at might show it coming off of the circumflex branch. It just depends on how that person's heart, uh, how those blood vessels form and uh, come together. So there are a lot of variations, normal variations of this. And again, sometimes they connect at the tip, sometimes they don't. Okay. Now if we look at uh, veins, because again, this is sending blood into the heart muscle itself to give it uh, oxygen, then uh, the veins that are going to be heading back to the coronary sinus here, um, we're going to have in the front here the great cardiac vein. Okay. Uh, we have over here the small cardiac uh, vein. And then uh, in the back, we have the middle cardiac vein. And then here's an anterior cardiac vein as well. I guess the biggies on here to really remember are the great cardiac vein, okay, the coronary sinus, the small cardiac vein, and yeah, that's about it. I guess the anterior cardiac vein as well. And this middle cardiac vein. Again, they're going to empty into the coronary sinus. Okay, cardiac muscle tissue. Um, if you remember from first semester that it's going to be striated and involuntary. Striated because you have the sliding filaments. Um, that's what makes it contract. So it's similar to skeletal muscle where you have a little striping. Okay, but we also have these things that we could find called intercalated discs. And here's the intercalated discs. And they're going to interdigitate um, the cells together. So you'll have one cell interdigitate with the other cell. And that's going to form a nice strong connection between the two cells. Now, cardiac muscle tissue is autorhythmic. In other words, it can beat on its own. Okay, When it comes in contact with other muscle tissues, um, it'll coordinate that beating so that they beat in unison. Well, how do they do that? Well, the way they can coordinate that beating is through these gap junctions. And that's how they communicate with one another chemically um, to coordinate that, uh, that uh, beating. And you can see here, um, very similar to skeletal muscle, you're going to have a sarcoplasmic reticulum, although it's not as developed. Okay, so it's not going to hold as much calcium as skeletal muscles do. You do still have the striping pattern. You have the sarcomere going from uh, Z-disc to Z-disc. You have your light and dark bands, your I bands and your A bands, etc. It's going to be a lot of mitochondria. Heart's going to need a lot of ATP. Okay, 
typically of a centrally located nucleus. Whereas with uh, skeletal muscles, if you remember, the nuclei were peripheral. Okay, these are going to be more centrally located. Okay, looking at the conduction system, the cardiac muscle cells are self-excitable and therefore autorhythmic. Cardiac muscle cells repeatedly generate spontaneous action potentials that then trigger heart contractions, and the cells form the conductive system, uh, which is the root of propagation of action potentials throughout the heart. And this is the conduction system. We're going to start off with the sinoatrial node, or SA node. If you ever watch... Um, you know, TV shows with like emergency rooms. Um, I remember watching, and most of you are probably too young to remember this TV show, ER. Um, every time they would bring somebody in and they would have them on uh, an EKG, they would look it up and they would say, okay, patient's in a sinus rhythm. Well, okay, patient's in a sinus rhythm. What's that mean? Is he breathing through his nose or? No, this is what they're talking about. That means that the electrical impulse that is making that heart beat is starting in the SA node or sinoatrial node. When we look at an EKG, I'll tell you how you can tell whether the patient's in a sinus rhythm. Okay, so that impulse starts in the SA node and it propagates out to the atria. It then goes to the AV node, the atrioventricular node, then through the AV bundle of His. Okay, AV stands for atrioventricular. Um, the old name is bundle of His. I just put it all together. So I call it the AV bundle of His. That way you're hitting all the bases. Then when we get to um, the septum of the heart, we have right and left bundle branches. Sometimes you can have some interference in there and you can wind up with a bundle branch block. I happen to have a right bundle branch block, okay, um, which is not severe. Um, my cardiologist told me that uh, I chose the right one um, because a left bundle branch block is, is more severe. Um, but there's right bundle branch, left bundle branch. When we get to the tip of the heart, then that signal is going to go up the Purkinje fibers, and this is going to give us a contraction. And, you know, I could go on and explain it more, but let's take a look at a video. Action potentials originate in the sinoatrial node and travel across the wall of the atrium from the sinoatrial node to the atrioventricular node. Action potentials pass slowly through the atrioventricular node to give the atria time to contract. They then pass rapidly along the atrioventricular bundle, which extends from the atrioventricular node through the fibrous skeleton into the interventricular septum. The atrioventricular bundle divides into right and left bundle branches, and action potentials descend rapidly to the apex of each ventricle along the bundle branches. Action potentials are carried by the Purkinje fibers from the bundle branches to the ventricular walls. The rapid conduction from the atrioventricular bundle to the ends of the Purkinje fibers allows the ventricular muscle cells to contract in unison, providing a strong contraction.